Before I begin uh, today, I'd like to kind of offer this, uh, this caveat. You can probably guess what I'm going to say about religion and women's marital happiness. But let me be clear here. I'm talking this morning about averages. And there are always exceptions to the rule. For instance, this is a text that I got from my wife about three months ago. And she was not happy, even though she is religious and a wife. <laughs> it probably had something to do with the fact that the family's pet hamster was on a fan in the family room, and her husband was 4,000 miles away in Barcelona giving a lecture on women's marital happiness. <laughs> <laughs> so beware here. Sometimes a social science doesn't always convey the whole picture, in this case, literally. So blue marriages are better. And by blue, I mean progressive marriages. This, this has become the new conventional wisdom. Couples who organize their lives around progressive values have long been seen as superior among the academics, the journalists, and the public intellectuals who dominate our public family conversation. Quote, we have every reason to believe that new values about marriage and sex roles will make it easier for parents to sustain and enrich their relationships. So wrote the feminist family historian Stephanie Kuntz in her book, The Way We Really Are, Coming to Terms with America's Changing Families, back in 1997. So at the end of the last century, Kuntz believed, the arc of family life was bending towards a better and brighter future in this new century, which meant, of course, a progressive one. And today, this view retains considerable currency. A report from the Council on Contemporary Families suggests that in today's so social climate, relationship quality and stability are generally highest in more egalitarian relationships. And writing in the New York Times, Nicholas Kristof said, conservatives thunder about family values, but don't practice them. It's actually liberals who practice the values that conservatives preach, Kristof wrote. And then Bloomberg opinion columnist Noah Smith agreed with all of this, adding his two cents. Quote, liberal morality is simply better adapted for creating stable two-parent families in a post-industrialized world. So you kind of get the picture here, right? The newer conventional wisdom is that progressive marriages organized along progressive lines are both stronger and more satisfying. Now, I think the value of this progressive model is more often assumed than explained by the elites who dominate our public family conversation. But analytically, the superiority of the progressive model is founded, I think, upon basically four points. The first is it's best and necessary to have a wife who works full time, the thinking goes. Full time work gives wives more bargaining power, a greater sense of meaning and the opportunity to make more important contributions to the public square. So having a husband who takes an essentially 50-50 approach to housework and childcare is ideal. Her ability to work is sustained by his willingness to do his share on the home front. The second idea here is that sharing paid work and the work of the home is supposed to foster a deeper marital friendship on the part of contemporary couples common experiences, common frustrations, and common triumphs at work at home pave the way for friendship between partners, is the thinking. The third idea here, right, is, sort of, is a sort of bigger point, and that is that equality, obviously, is now kind of taken to be a kind of a sacred value among today's elites. And so relationships marked by equality have a kind of totemic value in our contemporary world. So a 50-50 model is more in keeping with the West's supposedly egalitarian creed. And the fourth idea here is that biology kind of need not have any connection to people's social roles, um, social tasks. There is kind of really no fundamental and necessary connection between our biological nature and our social lives. Uh, biology, that is, has nothing really to do with, with sociology, is sort of, I think, the thinking here. So these four different kinds of ideas would explain why progressives would assume that more um, 
more egalitarian, more progressively ordered marriages are stronger and more stable. Now, couples like Kelly and Patrick, a couple that I've been interviewing for my uh, new book on marriage I'm working on, would certainly seem to vindicate the progressive vision of family life. Kelly reports that a big reason she survived what she joking refers to as the dark years in her marriage. These are the two years when she gave birth to two baby boys in 18 months while holding down a demanding job at a local bank and struggling to keep the spark in her marriage alive. Was that her husband Patrick did not assume that family life was primarily her job. After their boys were born, Patrick jumped in to do what needed to get done. The dirty dishes, the late night shopping, yes, even the laundry. And that's noteworthy because men kind of across the ideological spectrum are rarely found doing the family laundry. So for Kelly, who always wanted to combine full-time work and motherhood, her husband's can-do approach on the home front has been integral to her happiness at home and her success at work. Quote, I am so incredibly grateful for a partner who doesn't see housework and meals as helping me. It's all part of what needs to get done for the team, she says. Without someone who took this approach, it would be difficult for me to be successful in my career. And indeed, in my new report, The Ties That Bind, my colleagues and I find that secular progressive women like Kelly tend to do comparatively well on the relationship front. And you can kind of see this story playing out on the screens to your left um, and, and to your right. So what we're seeing here in this new research is that women who have a clearly progressive view about what the father should be doing in terms of earning and what the wife should be doing in terms of kind of the care uh, of the kids on the home front, that is kind of a more egalitarian view of those sort of two different roles, um, are happier if they're in a secular relationship where both husbands and wives have kind of a secular orientation to life. Um, so in a sense, women, wives on the clear left are doing better than women who have kind of a more ambiguous um, status vis-a-vis -vis their religious faith, um, and also compared to women who are conservative in their gender orientation um, and secular. Both they and their husbands are, are not integrated into a religious community. So, so far, so good for the idea that new values about marriage and sex roles will lead to richer relationships in the modern era. But for every Kelly out there, there are two Annas. So Anna's someone else that I've been interviewing for this, this book project. When she started having children, unlike Kelly, Anna had no wish to work full time outside the home. And indeed, approximately three quarters of married moms in America would rather not work full time. Of course, this is a statistic that you don't often hear about, I think, in college or in the pages of the New York Times. So this slide here gives you a sense of sort of where today married moms um, would like to be oriented in terms of work outside the home. So clearly, only about 28% of American married moms are like Kelly. And a much larger share of American moms would like to be working part-time or um, would like to be at home full-time. That's, that's the blue uh, pie piece here uh, in this chart, okay? So Anna is grateful that her husband, Greg, has work that allows her to devote more time to, uh, to their kids um, and to the family more generally. But much more than Greg's success as a breadwinner, what really makes Anna happy about her husband is he is fully engaged on the home front. Not only does Greg, so Greg do the diligent dad thing with the kids' nightly homework, he's also an exceptionally fun father. From flooding their backyard in the winter so the kids can ice skate, to traversing trails in the Shenandoah National Park in the summer, Greg makes sure that his kids' extracurricular lives are rich. He also takes an active role in the family's religious life every night. So in the evenings, after getting a high five from Anna, that's a little evening ritual, it's Greg who prays with their kids uh, before bedtime. I feel so blessed to have Greg as a husband, says Anna. 
His involvement as a father and leadership in the family only adds to my level of happiness, unquote, okay? So our report reveals that Anna is not alone. Her marriage is illustrative of the experience of many wives married to men from Catholic, evangelical, and Jewish communities. And yet it's an experience that's often overlooked in the public family conversation. Indeed, you can kind of see here on the slides to your left and right that women who are married to um, religious husbands are markedly happier um, than other wives uh, here in the U.S. And that the most happy wives are women who have both a religious sort of grounding for their marriage and who take kind of a more traditional view about the division of labor, where they sort of have this idea that men should focus more on breadwinning and women should focus more on the care of young children. Okay. So what's clearly the case here is that sort of contrary to the theory articulated at the beginning of this talk from Stephanie Kuntz, that uh, even kind of today in, in 2019, it's women who have this more traditional orientation and are ensconced in a more traditional religious community that are ones most likely to be flourishing um, in their marriages, at least when it comes to their overall satisfaction. But what about something like, for instance, sexual satisfaction? Does the same kind of story hold up for that? And the answer here is that yes. If you look at the bars here in yellow, which are sort of tracking um, wives in the US, what we see is that wives are much more likely to say that they're satisfied with their sexual relationship um, when they and their husbands are both um, engaged, uh, involved in a religious community. So this really, right, isn't really the story that we're getting in our pop culture. You know, this isn't really kind of like the Cardi B or Little Dicky story that you might expect, right? It's actually the people who are probably taking a more kind of traditional approach to sexuality that are ones most likely to report that they're satisfied. And then when it comes to divorce, research by Tyler Vanderweel at Harvard University also sees a kind of religious advantage um, on the marital stability front, which might surprise the Bloomberg columnist uh, Noah Smith. So we can see here that uh, religious women, this is on the sort of the farthest bar on the right here, are about 40% less likely to get divorced um, than their peers who are not regularly attending religious services. Um, so again, there's a kind of a connection here between religious practice, religious faith, um, and enjoying um, greater marital stability. So in, in making sense of these kinds of findings, uh, you know, I suppose that, that some of my colleagues in the academy or journalists or other public intellectuals were kind of thinking about these issues, might think, well, maybe there's something really happening here that's in the sort of in, in the direction of equality, that maybe something about how um, marriages on kind of on the clear progressive left, and even marriages clearly on the sort of religious right, um, incorporate some degree of gender equality that would be driving the kinds of results that we're um, coming up with here uh, today. Um, but I, you know, I've got a different take on, on this. I think for most ordinary wives uh, in the US, um, it's not about 50-50. Not about 50-50. It's about him being invested in her life and the life of the kids. It's about him being practically and emotionally invested in the marriage and the family. Okay. So Anna, for instance, couldn't care less if Greg is doing precisely half the chores in their household. What concerns her is that his attention and his affections are directed towards her and to their children. And in fact, in kind of listening to the happiest secular progressive wives and their religiously conservative counterparts, what I have noticed is something that they actually share in common is what I would call kind of devoted family men, okay? Devoted family men. So in a, in a weird way today, I think that both feminism and faith, for people kind of on these opposite spectrums here, um, are giving men a clear code for family life, where they're supposed to play a big role in their kids' lives, 
you know, devoted dads are de rigueur in these two communities, uh, from Dove men's care ads to daddy dances in their different ways. These two communities are getting the message out that men are expected to engage on the family front. And it shows both culturally progressive and religiously conservative fathers report high levels of paternal engagement and as we've seen, have happier wives. I need to say that one good thing that's changed in the last half century, right, that's sort of changed in these last 50 years, um, is that we're expecting more of men when it comes to family life, okay? The practical realities of family life. But what explains the comparative advantage of religiously conservative women um, in this research that I and some colleagues have been engaged in? You know, why are they the most likely to report that they're satisfied in their marriages, for instance? I think part of the story here is that conservative women are more likely to realize that marriage is much more than a soulmate relationship. And you know, starting in the 1960s and especially in the 1970s, a lot of people began to think that marriage is just about an intense connection between two people that's supposed to meet our needs, our emotional erotic needs. This was an adult-centered model of marriage. This was an individualistic model of marriage. And this was a model of marriage that rejected the till death do us part ethic. In the soulmate model, you're in it for as long as your love shall last. You know, that, that was kind of the ethic that, um, that obtained and still obviously sort of shapes our thinking about uh, relationships, romance, um, and marriage. And we can think right here, for instance, of Elizabeth Gilmer, the author of Eat, Pray, Love, the best-selling book that became a movie. She leaves her first husband a journey halfway across the world in search of new experiences, fulfillment, and eventually a soulmate. She wants to feel it all, to feel it intensely. And going from Italy to India to Indonesia, she ends up finding her soulmate, Jose Nunez, in Bali, in Indonesia. But you know, it turns out that feelings are a fickle foundation for married life. And so she ends up leaving Jose. And now, at age 50, Gilbert is again single, living perhaps uh, without love. Now, the point I want to make here is that religiously conservative women are not like Liz Gilbert. They recognize, they realize that marriage is much more that intense emotional connection between two people, okay? It's much more than that. They realize that sort of it's oriented towards creating a family, creating a new life together with your spouse and then with any kids that come along. So kind of, they have a family first approach to marriage that's founded upon what I would kind of call the five pillars and I've got five C's to sort of make this argument um, that I'm thinking about now in this new book project. So the first C, that I think is sort of characteristic of religiously conservative women is this idea of communion, of seeing your marriage in terms of a community of persons. It's about we, not me. It's about the UVA basketball team, hence the colors today, um, not the Duke Blue Devils, right? <laughs> team over individual glory. It's about putting the team, again, above the sort of individual orientation. So conservative women and men realize that marriage is about sharing your life, sharing your name, sharing your money. It's not about advancing your own individual agenda. Now, I can kind of illustrate this by talking about an experience that I had here in Princeton in graduate school um, a number of years ago. Um, and I was talking to a colleague in the, the graduate program, um, and we were both getting a graduate stipend from Princeton University to kind of, you know, get by here um, while in graduate school. And she was relating to me her frustration about the fact that she couldn't buy a couch. Um, she had an apartment actually near to our apartment, and um, 
living with her husband, I think, and they had maybe one or two small kids at that point. Um, and she was kind of talking about this, and I was just kind of like scratching my head. Because her husband was a lawyer uh, working in the area, making, I'm sure, a healthy salary. And I couldn't really figure out, like, why you can't just buy that couch. Well, it turns out that she and her husband had cohabited prior to marriage. And when they were cohabiting, they'd set up a pattern of having separate, right, separate checking accounts. Makes sense when you don't have that kind of, that commitment locked in. And they'd maintain the practice, once they'd gotten married, of keeping two separate accounts for themselves. So she literally did not have enough money in her account to buy this couch that she wanted, even though I'm sure that her husband had plenty of money in his account <laughs> to buy the, the couch. And this is just kind of a, a mystery to me because my wife and I have a joint checking account. And if there was enough money in the account and she wanted the couch, she would just buy the couch, right? So this is just sort of one example of the way in which kind of this more individualistic approach to marriage when it comes to money, when it comes to names, when it comes to sort of your broader orientation, I think can be um, corrosive uh, for marriage. The second point I, I want to make is about kids. Uh, the C word here, of course, is children. And the point here is that husbands and wives who recognize that a core purpose of marriage is to provide their children with a strong and stable home life are much more likely today to be flourishing not just sort of stably married, but flourishing in their marriages. Now, I'm not talking here about sort of helicopter parenting, where parents are just constantly trying to make their kids' lives easier. I'm talking about recognizing that your marriage is about much more than your own individual fulfillment. It's about forging a strong and stable home for your kids. But what's fascinating here is that the new data stuff that I'm looking at, the analyses that I'm looking at, indicates that husbands and wives who are strongly committed to marrying uh, before they have kids are markedly more likely to report that they're happy in their marriages. So at least today, couples who have kind of have this child-centered appreciation of marriage are more likely to be satisfied um, you know, in their marriages, of course, stably married as well. The third C is about commitment. And the idea here is that conservative, religiously conservative women and men are much more likely to embrace a till death do us uh, apart ethic. Uh, when it comes to marriage, not an eat, pray, love approach uh, to marriage. They're also more likely to embrace um, an ethic of marital fidelity and kind of to be sort of thinking about that practically, um, recognizing that that ethic of marital permanency and ethic of marital fidelity require not just sort of abstract norms and, and notions, but concrete practices. So think, for instance, of this guy named Patrick, who is a tall and handsome real estate agent uh, red-haired guy, uh, plays in a band, I kid you not, once a month, um, but who's happily and stably married. And he meets a lot of people and travels a lot for his work. And these are both risk factors for infidelity for someone like him. But he's intentional about protecting his marriage. And one of his secrets is this, quote, when I'm meeting new people in my line of work, I talk a lot about my wife and kids. I want them to know I'm a family man, unquote. So what he's doing here is he's kind of throwing up an invisible fence around himself and around his marriage. And in so doing, he's protecting himself from what social scientists would call attractive alternatives um, to his wife. And you know, not surprisingly, uh, my research finds too that men and women who embrace this kind of ethic um, are more likely to be happier uh, in their marriages uh, as well. Now, the fourth pillar here is cash, okay? And I, I think we can all appreciate how money matters, and there's no surprise there. You know, having a decent income helps families get by. It comes to housing, comes to food, when it comes to schooling, et cetera. And to be frank, I think it's a big reason why there are many prosperous liberals within 15 miles of this room here who are happily and especially stably married. I think today, there was some confusion in the 70s, but I think today among many elites, there's a growing recognition that all of this, right, the 401k, the house in Princeton, 
um, and the kid's college career, they all depend upon kind of keeping it together when it comes to marriage. But even on kind of this fourth pillar, I think what's uh, kind of a comparative advantage for religious conservatives is they recognize that in terms of the financial piece, that men's breadwinning is especially important for marital stability and, and marital quality, perhaps. Because the research actually tells us that his employment matters um, for marital stability, and hers actually does not. So work by Sasha Kilowald at Harvard in sociology tells us that when husbands lose their jobs, marriages are much more likely to collapse. But when wives lose their jobs, nothing much happens in terms of marital stability. And this kind of insight, that there's something about male breadwinning that's particularly important uh, for the stability, the sustenance of a marriage. You know, this is kind of um, not news, I think, to many religious conservatives, where it is, I think, often more of a surprise to more progressive-minded uh, Americans. The final C is about community. And I think, you know, over the years, many Americans have kind of thought of themselves as lone rangers, as, uh, as individuals. But the truth is, as Aristotle taught us, that we are social animals. We do better when we have strong and deep ties with friends and family members. Our welfare depends upon our social connections. And couples are especially likely to thrive when they are connected to a community, especially a religious community. Now, I could talk to you on this fifth C. I could talk to you when it comes to church about the networks found in, you know, found in churches and how they afford husbands and wives crucial emotional, social, and practical support for the work of raising a family. I could talk to you about the nomos. This is the sacred canopy that faith casts over our lives. And how that nomos helps husbands and wives navigate the slings and arrows of life the stresses that can otherwise derail a marriage. I could talk to you about the norms, things like fidelity and forgiveness that tend to ground and guide religious couples. But I want to say something different about the power today of shared faith. And that is that I think it helps to inoculate contemporary couples against succumbing to the soulmate myth. Because as I said sort of before, I think many people today, many couples today, look at marriage as an opportunity again to enjoy a soulmate, to think about the relationship in terms of how does this make me feel good? How does it make me happy? How does it make me enriched? You know, and they expect to be sort of fulfilled most all of the time in their marriage. But this kind of soulmate orientation to marriage puts a heavy burden on the relationship. Because no relationship, no person, is capable of providing us with ultimate meaning, with ultimate happiness in life. By contrast, couples who focus on something larger than themselves, on their faith, for instance, some larger good, some larger project, are paradoxically more likely to enjoy a strong and stable marriage. And that's for a couple of reasons, but you know, it's for instance because of the fact that their relationship doesn't have to meet unrealistic expectations. It's because they're more likely to see marriage as an opportunity to serve rather than to satisfy their own desires and needs. And because they have just kind of some common project that they're engaged um, in, you know, as a couple. And so faith can reinforce here, the idea that marriage is much more than just a soulmate relationship. And I think this is another reason why religious wives are more likely to be satisfied um, and more likely to enjoy stable unions as well. Now, before I close, I want to make just one more kind of somewhat orthogonal point. It's not sort of directly on this question of marital happiness, but it is, I think, relevant to, to kind of bear in mind as we kind of move forward today, and that is that I, you know, I think even 30 years ago, we didn't necessarily see a strong ideological divide in patterns of who was marrying. But I think one more point that kind of the, the progressive mentality misses today 
is that it's actually conservatives today, not progressives. And I don't say this with any kind of glee, it's more it's like, almost like a sense of sadness that marriage has become so kind of polarized in our society. But it's clearly the case too that when it comes to actually who's getting married in the first place and, and staying married in the second place, that conservatives today are much more likely to be marrying um, and they're more likely to be stably married as well. So it's kind of one more piece to this sort of idea that kind of the blue model um, doesn't do a good job of explaining not only who is most happy in their marriages, uh, but who is most likely to be married kind of in, you know, in, in the first place. So let me conclude. When you put all of this kind of together, I think what you see emerging is a fundamentally Burkean story about marriage. Okay? So of course, this is, not a, this is not a progressive story about marriage, right? This is a rather different story about marriage. And I'm referring, obviously, here to Edmund Burke, the great Anglo-Irish thinker who understood the importance of tradition in guiding social life. But I also want to make the point that he understood as well the importance of reforming our traditions to keep them vital. That is the importance, again, of reforming our traditions to keep them vital. That was one of Burke's key insights as well. So the tradition, kind of in the West broadly understood about marriage, teaches us that children, that commitment to marital permanence and fidelity, that cash, and the community matter for our families. And the tradition is right in all of these ways, okay? It's still right in 2019. But what's new, I think, is that we expect a lot more of men in the home um, in recent years. And I think this is an important insight, an example of the way in which we can recognize, like Burke, that our traditions are always in need of reformation, of reform. So in this case, I would contend today, I would argue today, that the best marriages are neo-traditional. They're neo in the sense that they're calling men to do more on the home front, but they're traditional in the sense that they incorporate a lot of old school wisdom about you know, the core purposes of marriage, the ones that are you know, mentioned up here on, on the screen. So in other words, a big reason that conservative religious wives are the happiest wives in America is that they and their husbands Realize that a successful marriage is about more than finding and seeking your own fulfillment in a soulmate. It's about serving your spouse and your kids. It's about creating a common way of life together and being married to a man who believes likewise. Or in more biblical language, the happiest wives today are ones who are members of communities that understand the importance in the words of the prophet Malachi, of turning the hearts of the fathers to their children. Thank you. <laughs>